Well, I guess it started with Napalm Death. You know, they, uh, they're pretty much one of the first bands in the world to play the way they do. And like, they influenced most of the other bands on the label, as well as you know, all the grindcore bands in the world, really. And uh, I got to know them through, uh, just with friends with them, basically, in 86. And so uh, they made a demo tape and no one else would touch it, no other labels or anything. So um, I thought, well, you know, I loved it. So I put it out and uh, that was their first album, Scum. Um, so after that, you know, that became the blueprint for uh, most of the other bands around. This is No Palm Death on what we can say a Tuesday afternoon in Birmingham by the canal. You can see great setting, chopped and weakened at the same time. I'm a totally happy person. I mean, when we're chop, you know we're chop. When we're ping, well, that's slightly too. That's like slightly like that's yeah. like you're not happy. You're pinging bad. Someone <laughs> pinged you. Yeah, you know, they've, they've pissed you off. Weakened, well, that is when you're like you're gone to be. Are <laughs> you ready you're for a rhino charge? You're ready for rhino charge. You know. You know. I was in Terrorizing. I was in a band called Righteous Pigs. We just sort of met them through like tape trading, I guess, magazines, and just uh, writing and sending tapes and just saying like Jeff with Napalm and stuff like that. Napalm was sort of, I guess, promoted in such a fashion that not, not forced down people's throats, but it was in places where you know, people could see it and they sort of thought, well, what's this like, the fastest band in the world, sort of thing, in quotes. We sort of abandon musical standards. We don't like songs to, you know, the, the rock sort of format. I mean, we, I think we're pretty much the end of the line. I don't think they're going to get a band that's going to go more extreme than us. Well, my dad, he's, he got me into his sort of thing, you know, I mean, it started from the, the early extremes, like no dream and stuff. And uh, my dad, like, he understands everything about Napalm, you know, I mean, he doesn't just like it just because, you know, I've taken an active part in the band, he actually is into the music sort of thing and he understands it. My know. dad doesn't understand it, he never will. Yeah. No, I'm only, he never <laughs> understands it. Sure. Oh, well, he's, he's coming to his... Turn it down, turn that bass down, that's stupid. Yeah, what that's sort of vocals cool. are then? Inside, I don't know what it is. So it's so chuffed that everything can, I don't know what else I can say. I'm just bloody chuffed. The music we play, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think you can get any more extreme. To speed wise, it's the fastest. I'm proud to say it's the fastest. You know, nothing can be faster. Sorry, Dave, you know what I mean, but you know, it's just not fast enough, mate.
never going to be any hints of melody. No, far me out. I mean, it's uh, something that I wouldn't personally like to sort of go into because it bore the fucking tits off me. Um, I mean, we, we, we just write it naturally, you know, I mean, we don't strive to do anything. I mean, some songs could, you know, turn out to be like two minutes long and then we'll do one, it'll be a minute long and, and whatever, you know, I mean, there's such a, a diversity of, of lengths. It's just whatever we're happy with, we'll just say, right, just go for it and I'll go away with the tape and just write the lyrics over the top, so. <laughs> People just are more, more interested in restraining themselves these days instead of going fucking mad like. And I just, it, you just lose a certain amount of the music if you do that, I think. I'd say things have got a lot more aggressive music style. No, it's it's yeah. you know, the songs are a lot longer, but that doesn't mean you know, anything's changed. So there's a lot more going on with the songs now. Whereas before we'd you know, do like the average song was anywhere between 30 seconds and a minute. I mean, well, you can only fit so much into that. You know, but now we've got songs up to I guess three and a half, four minutes, which I guess is going to be the maximum. I mean, we can fit a lot more into that nowadays, and there's just a lot more going on. I've only got one hobber, getting tattooed. <laughs> my legs, my back, and my arms. I mean, I'm totally into it. John Foster Tattoo Studio, Birmingham, Selly. Show me tattoos. Show them a few. Show them back. <laughs> if you want to have a look, yeah. you know, I'm yeah. fucking. <laughs> yeah, I'm just... I'm just... No, this is punk, this one on the back. <laughs> <laughs> Guess like my arms. That is a classic. <laughs> Taken from a, a really old, I guess, famous yeah, I've got, paint. I've got shit on my legs, you know what I mean? Fucking, I guess all over, really, you know what I mean? This leg as well, fucking. I'm working on this, fucking. I guess, you know, all over. I'm going for a full Japanese bodysuit, <laughs> then I'll be chuffed. Yeah. Until I'm, except for, the, except for my face, hands, feet. That's where it stops. You haven't mentioned your willing. Nah, nothing on, nothing on the dick either. <laughs> my ass, that's going to be tattooed. I mean, what really happened was uh, there were a few bands in America that English bands were picking up on, but they were like, uh, I mean, bands like Siege, a Boston band, and a band called Repulsion. Um, I mean, they were like very unknown in America, but the, de the demo tapes sort of made it over to England, and uh, bands like Napalm Death and Carcass and stuff. 
were real big fans of that of that, that style, you know. Um, and they just it just came about that they they got noticed quicker than uh, some of these bands in America. You know, they put records out, whereas these uh, the early American bands didn't really make it onto vinyl. It was like an underground scene, you know, where people would send each other tapes around, and uh, at first no record labels were interested in it. Um, it was all done on a kind of tape trading type of circuit, which, you know, d you know, got the music around really well actually. And uh, a lot of the bands that we have on the label now that are quite well known, I mean, they they do actually owe their early uh, notoriety to people that were taping their tr uh, tapes around and stuff, and just trading it around. Um, bands like Morbid Angel were like really well known before they even had a record out, you know. We put their album out in uh, 89, in, in the summer of 89, but they were around from 84 or so, and uh, lots of people had their tapes even before they made a record. So they were already well known and established, almost, before their actual album came out. Hi, I'm David Vincent, uh, bassist and vocalist for Morbid Angel. <laughs> By the time that we got to the concrete lineup, which we have now, uh, consisting of myself, uh, Pete Sandoval on drums, and Trey and Richard both on uh, guitar, um, this is a, really the prime, more of an angel lineup. The Grind Crusher tour we did with Napalm Death uh, and added Carcass and Bolt Thrower for the UK went over real well. Uh, it was our first European tour. Uh, it gave us a chance to be exposed to uh, European audiences and it gave them a chance to see us for the first time. And I think, uh, although we didn't make an awful lot of money, uh, really didn't make a lot of anything besides uh, got sick and uh, got pissed every night. And Napalm Death are just a bunch of crazy guys, man. I've never toured with any band that is more intense than they are. They're just incredible. <laughs> We have stuff that's very fast that would maybe make us a bit grinding. Um, we've got some stuff that's kind of classical sounding. Uh, labels uh, really have not always meant a whole lot to me. Um, I think it's, it's really what you do and labels are for the press more than anything else. <laughs> We shot a live uh, video uh, out of a lot of footage that was taken on the Grind Crusher tour, uh, predominantly at Rock City in Nottingham, and we put a video together uh, for the song Immortal Rights, which is the first track on Altars of Madness. It's, well, primarily about a, kind of a seance meditative ritual uh, in which you are you're sh shedding the outer skin and going into the inner skin. I've been accused of all kinds of things in my time. Um, satanic is, is just one of them. Satanism could could be selfism or humanism very easily, um, and this idea of actually worshiping the devil, okay, as opposed to worshiping uh, Christ, you know, just just turning that around, and anything that would be good would be bad, and then only in doing that, um, well, it may be right for some people. Um, I, I don't see much logic in it.
I, I don't find it to be very intelligent. I, I still find it having a master over the self. I think the, the planet uh, is, is headed for quite an uproar, both, uh, well, really resources are getting used up at, at such a quick rate, we have such a population explosion, and I think, actually, I think the world is really starting to wake up in a lot of ways. This can be the subconscious, and this can be the conscious. This is what you take in or what's given to you every day. And this is what you think in response deep inside to what you see and this is where this is the room that you have to live your life and you can live your life as a, a complete raving lunatic and idiot or you can live your life as a, a, a total uh, mainstream flowing kind of person and for the most part I tend to live my life over here but I know the rules of this game and I can kind of float myself over this way and do what I need to and then kind of go back to where I, I feel more comfortable. It's kind of like walking through a cafeteria line. Uh, I could easily be a robot and go through with my tray and allow them to put on whatever they're going to put on and take that back and eat it and not think about it. And when I found out that I really didn't like some of those things, then um, I felt more inclined to go to a, a self-service place where I could put on my plate what I wanted and leave the rest. Well, Morbid Angel were a bit different, really. I mean, uh, they're one of the first American bands that we signed. And uh, they were also one of the first bands that we signed that were totally involved in the death metal scene, you know, especially the one in Florida, which is uh, you know, happening right now. There's uh, tons of bands there who came out of that particular scene. Well, the grindcore scene is kind of like, it's all mixed in together. It's, you've got like some of your hardcore people still, you know, that are into punk and stuff, and they like grindcore a lot. Then you have your people that are into the heavier thrash stuff that, you know, like grindcore too. So it's kind of like a crossover type thing. But I think generally a lot of people that would listen to like Metallica and stuff aren't into grindcore yet here. But over in Europe, like, you know, your whole crowd will be always just into grindcore. You know, they're all like death metal crowds and stuff over there. have been using keyboards in the studio and like live tapes and stuff like that for a really long time you know as far as I can remember back you know Merciful Fate bands like that they use keyboards and it, to me you know it just um, 
we're like I guess the only band that actually has a keyboard player like all the time. I've had people come up to me like in Europe and go, man, you know, I'm so pissed off because I, I wanted to put keyboards in the band that we were doing a year ago. And I said, no, you know, it's not the thing. And then here comes your album, you know, and it's like, and it's there and it's accepted and, and they're kicking themselves in the ass for not having done it before, you know. It's really the only thing that's limited is movement as far yeah. as being able to move around, you know, a whole lot. But since I'm pretty much locked behind there anyway, I, I'm limited to just thrashing where I'm at, so it doesn't matter if it's if I'm on three feet or, you know, a huge stage. I used to play Morbid Angel, and that was like back in like '84 to '86, you know. Well, I think basically the Tampa and, and Florida whole scene is, is, is what happened. It started a long time ago, like the early '80s, with bands like Nasty Savage and Death and Morbid Angel and Sabotage. And um, what's happened is like the people have been into that kind of music for quite a long time. And they're just like used to it, and it breeds a lot of really good musicians there that want to do that kind of music. Whenever anybody tells me they're thinking about moving their band down to Florida, I say, hey, you know, it couldn't hurt. Nocturnus is trying to get into uh, the, the fantasy uh, fiction um, with, with the evil, but also in various locations, you know, and any kind of bizarre locations we can, like, come up with and, and create a sonic image of that, you know. Our songs are more like short stories, and they're all kept at a very fictional level to where it's like, you know, somebody can't actually go out and, you know, build a time machine in their backyard and go back in time, you know, I mean, it's like when you have some bands that are talking about sacrificing people or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, people can actually go out and do that stuff and that's where, you know, it gets, there's, there's the line that you draw between, you know, real life and, and fantasy. telling people is just you know go out and use your own strengths and, and you know make your own way in this world you know basically and uh, that's like the real thrust of it I mean we do take a pretty a pretty brutal swing at a uh, at Christ and uh, and his followers in a way but uh, really it's just like it's just like taking a swipe at him to try to you know bite him down a notch to show that that's really not you know, an all-inclusive thing that people just need to, like, blindly follow anything, any religion, Satanism, Christianity, anything like that. only so fast you can play and there's only so heavy you can be without it all sounding the same or without it just being a blur so you know maybe we've opened up a whole new branch of direction of, of way to go with the music you know we're like 
where these people would never listen to something with keyboards before. Now they're listening to that and they're going, well, yeah, that's pretty good. It's working, you know, and, and they're opening their mind up and expanding this music so it doesn't get closed in into one, you know, genre or whatever, you know, it, it's just like, as long as it keeps expanding and bands keep experimenting and doing different things, it's not going to die out. No, it seems to go to and fro across the Atlantic. There's, it started with a few bands in America that never got record deals, but were like pretty influential on, on the, uh, on the new scene starting in England. You know, this kind of grind scene, and bands like Carcass, Napalm Death, Unseen Terror, who were around at the early days. They, I mean, they got their records out through me, whereas a lot of other record labels wouldn't have even bothered touching them. You know, it's like this is noise. You know, what can we do with that? It doesn't sell. But that doesn't really bother me. You know, I was just into the. The music and the sound, and um, it just seemed natural that we put their records out, you know. you can put in categories but I think it's silly trying to put people who you're not too sure about into categories I'd rather s bridge a scene if I could and just uh, have people call us um, Paradise Lost rather than saying oh they're a death on them there and whatever mm -hmm. well, it's, I don't, far, it's far too limiting tags, yeah tags are too the, limiting uh, the grind core tags far, far too limiting I mean you, you don't have to sort of say they wouldn't it, like put people off who might be into it you know it's, there wasn't that kind of tag there. I mean, the newest stuff from Trap put the melody and songwriting back into this kind of music because it's losing it. I've got to be really, really miserable to write songs. I can't be in a good mood, I've got to be really pissed off. Well, uh, when I've got a pay rent at the beginning of the month, that depresses me. And uh, if the dog has a shit in the kitchen, that really depresses me. Bad headaches and uh, when I'm drunk. Um, when my dad got killed in a car crash, that really brought a down on it, that one. But um, now they didn't really, I'm not kidding. Um, all kinds of things, really. Just life, life. Wow. 
I don't want to get throat cancer. I know, I've heard people tell me about um, you have little things cut off back here throughout. So modules. Like, modules. Modules. And because I had George Michael had it done, so I've got to go and get it done too, I think. But no, I do worry about it actually. So I try not to overdo it because you can really overdo it and make us split your blood vessels in your eyes and you get like blood clots down the side of you. It's quite nasty. It's only happened once or twice. Mm. So. My eyeball actually popped out once, it actually fell onto the stage and I managed to pick it up and put it back in before Greg Trudden. <laughs> is about uh, the confrontation between uh, good and evil. I used to worship the devil in 1982. And he used to have upside down crosses painted on my bedroom walls. They worshipped a venom. I worshipped venom. And, uh, the and Satan as well. One and the same. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Sexy after Sexy our and moist. And moist. Warm. And you know, fluffy. fluffy. Direct. With a, a touch of sweat. <laughs> but uh, apart from that, pretty damn moist. <laughs> Grind, Grind can be defined as a death metal with a thoughtful edge. It's usually uh, got a lot of thought into it, something about uh, overpopulation, problems of the world, death. Certainly. Genocide. Genocide. We all like genocide. genocide. <laughs> Couldn't live without genocide. Eh? A lot of good vegans out there. Yeah, yeah. These bands are strange. They're vegan. I mean, they're hippies. They're just dirty hippies playing very loud music. Basically, we consider that the world is a, a reflection of people's minds. And if you look at the world being in a very sorry state, surely that's a reflection of our minds. So if we adjust our minds, perhaps we can adjust the world. That's our outlook. That's what we try and do. This one's called Raise Against Time. You don't know it, you're lying. <laughs> It's a shame that things have to turn into fashion, fashion, fashion orientated. It's a shame. But there again, if this short period of time, people, whilst it's in fashion, listen to it and appreciate it and perhaps learn from it because uh, they haven't experienced it before. Even when this fashion goes, these <coughs> thoughts, these feelings might stay. I mean, uh, we're around from the, the early punk days and we we're all punks, but uh, it's still true to our hearts. And uh, it's not exactly fashionable now, but uh, it's still in our hearts. We've got to progress with the times. 
musically as well as mentally. You want it too accessible, otherwise people are going to hear it once and think, yeah, I've heard that, I know what they sound like. You need people to listen again, and that way the lyrics will come into play if they bother to take further interest. Just keeping the guitars at the right level of dirtiness, really. You don't want it too clean at all, otherwise, yeah, we're going to end up sounding like Bon Jovi or something ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> if I write a riff, I'm never actually satisfied with it unless it actually makes me feel a little bit uneasy or something like that, unless it evokes a real reaction in me. I can't see the point of playing it to people, really. <laughs> Well, basically, you can be conditioned by the world, racism, how we consider other people, how our parents consider ethnic minorities is rubbed off on their children. Our parents condition us in these ways. Religion, Religion is a prime example, although I must state I feel deeply for religion. Not all religions, specific religions. Sexism, basically ignorance. Our minds have made us ignorant, have led us into ignorance. Our minds have to get us back out of ignorance. We must be accountable for ourselves. <laughs> I must stress that nothing we do is drug orientated in any way. We, we just simply, that is restrictive. This is a, a totally pure state of mind that we're trying to achieve. Not influenced by any means of drugs. That's restrictive. That's escapism. And uh, we have to be realistic. <laughs> It's hard to progress, it's hard to sacrifice, but once you understand that what you give, you get back, it makes the giving more worthwhile. But having said that, that just works for me. For other people, find your own methods. Follow your method and achieve the result it serves. When Thrash started, you know, you had people, Metallica, Slayer, Anthrax, and all that came out. And like, when I was into those bands like from day one, you know, I thought they were excellent and especially Slayer they just blew me away when I saw them in London and stuff and uh, people were just saying oh it's, it's, it's noise you know it's not music it's just bullshit he's not singing you know but uh, you know we knew at the time that Napalm Death and stuff make Slayer sound like Bon Jovi really you know the way the vocals sound and the way the instruments just go full tilt you know um, but uh, it's just taken people a while to kind of catch on, you know, because thrash fans, they're always looking for something heavier, something faster, something more extreme. They always will, you know. There's just some kind of attitude that defines the bands, really. It's uh, and a vague kind of sound, but there's like, there's room for innovation and experimentation within the whole scene. And you've got bands like Godflesh who use a drum machine, and, uh, you know, they have really heavy riffs. Uh, nowadays, they're getting a bit more, um, 
experimental with their sound, like using samplers and stuff. I'm Justin Broderick, I'm guitar and vocals for Godflesh. I'm Paul Neville, and I play guitar in, but guitar for Godflesh. And this is Cal Los Angeles. And we're about to play the country club, California, Los Angeles. We're probably the heaviest thing people are ever going to hear in a coherent sense. I mean, there's loads of bands that just tune down and go, but like we've actually got sound there, and it's actually unique, and it is fucking heavy. We just present people with a lot of harsh, vivid visuals that we can relate to of things we really like, and then just present it to people in, we go, oh, we get all this stuff, and then just shove it in people's faces, and say, oh, what do you think? And we're not saying to people, think this, we're saying, what do you think? So we're trying to say, we're trying to provoke a reaction. <laughs> Like existence is based upon like a, a sort of paranoid outlook on things. But I see like paranoia as awareness in a sort of in a similar, I mean, basically uh, there is you know, dividing line really, I guess. I see being, being totally paranoid as being totally aware. We just like intense images, something that's like really strong. Yeah, before. everything we use is intense and extreme because that's the only things we can relate to is extremities. in England, yeah, it's been really, really favourable, and in Europe in general. The press in America is probably even more favourable, I think, in a way. I think we're getting better press in the States. We're getting better received. <laughs> <laughs> the slayer comes bursting out of it. It's good, the slider just burst in on it, it's really cool, actually. Our bass player, I mean, he listens to Beach Boys religiously. I mean, he loves the Beach Boys. I mean, he collects all the CDs. He loves the Beach Boys. And if that's probably the most extreme, far away thing I could think of. Um, but then again, in a lot of the purity of their sound and stuff, the way they do things is probably very close to what we do sometimes. We played the Killdozer once. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but people are familiar with Killdozer. Oh, 
and we played like a lot louder than Killdozer and we played with like full something like 8,000 watts total full power and uh, we know of, of one person in the audience who actually lost their hearing that night totally there was uh, apparently a, a couple of women who actually orgasmed through the, through the volume I don't know, I'd like to add thanks to Arden Heavy for being on this video because I mean, we probably don't fit into the whole genre really that well. But um, it's great to see that we are. I mean, that, that, cause this has crossed over instantly already. This is, this is causing something which is different. Uh, and something to add is just for, is just for people to, to start appreciating and opening their heads to something something unusual and for, for people who just who just solely listen to metal who are watching this video I'd like them to, to listen to God Flesh and just appreciate something which is more mind only heavy so if people want heaviness and they've got it here I mean there's nothing heavier but uh, we're not saying that on a sort of we're the heaviest band in the world we're not going for that angle we're just going for we're God Flesh and this is what we do the noise the power the feeling up the back of your spine it does move you. It's psychedelic in a in a sense, you know, it's very it does change you. I think it changes your inner rhythms definitely. And it and it stays with you for a long time. It's good stuff. It rings in your ears for a while. <laughs>
it just kind of happened. It just kind of happened, and we just needed some noise. I mean, you know, I hear that in 92 they're going to make noise illegal in here in the That's EUC. It. Mm. Quaint this is old Europe serious. is telling us for our own benefit that any noise more than about 100 it's decibels, whether it's a car, a jackhammer, a gig, a fight, anything will be illegal. So, like, let's go deaf in the meantime. After that, then we really will go underground. Mm. We'll have to go underground. There will be secret deaf people conferences yeah. where we'll all play <laughs> deaf records with a TH as loud as possible because we're already deaf with an F just to see if we can still hear them. Our audience should, should. We want them to experience um, something extreme. We want them to go out feeling like they've been beaten up. Deaf. And, uh, yeah, we'd like them to go out hurting. Just go home to recuperate. Remember it for the next three days. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of discussion about what a nice idea it would be to uh, tear gas people, play at sort of uh, ridiculously low frequencies to make them shit and vomit, <laughs> and, uh, and then sort of blind them with sort of incredibly bright Horror flashes, yeah. and uh, then let them go home after that. It would be very it's a nice idea, though. but it would be very difficult to do, and I think you'd uh, run into trouble with the uh, <laughs> health and safety people. The first lineup of Sonic Bars is sort of totally different. The bassist had a very unusual sound, they had a, a, a low rumble with a very lot of treble clang in there and a good snarl in there as well. And he left and moved up north. So uh, I thought the only way I was going to recreate that bass sound was to have two basses, but we've gone beyond the original bass sound now. I think there's a, a lot of bands in the um, in the thrash sort of sphere and in the death metal sphere. There, there's a, a lot of bands that are playing very, very similar music, and none of them seem to be leaving themselves sort of anywhere to develop out of that. But, uh, I think we don't really fit into any any category. Where people always have a great deal of difficulty in pigeonholing us. So uh, I think you know we really we can take it anywhere we want. The only thing we want to do is uh, never lighten up what we're doing. Always try and make it heavier and more intense. You can't pound people into the floor with guitar solos. When I was younger, it was useful to me to be introduced to lots of ideas that maybe I hadn't hadn't seen before you know, during this sort of early punk time. That was very beneficial to me. I learned a lot from sort of bands like Crass, sort of people like that, sort of discussing things with them at times, and uh, made me think a lot, did me a lot of good, and hopefully we'll be able to pass on the same kind of uh, process to, to people who come and see us. Well, 
we had uh, quite a few skinheads come and see us in uh, Germany, but um, they were uh, they were all belong to something called Sharp, which is skinheads against racial prejudice. And they're all all right. They're not like your standard sort of Nazi moron skinhead. Right. Life in general was uh, something sort of tedious and a bit wishy-washy. Which I think most of sort of existence is people are just too content to just go and sit down in front of a video and it's just slow death waiting to die. We should get out and do something for themselves. I can't explain why it seems to be sort of um, catching on. It, but it definitely is, most certainly. There's a, um, I don't know, perhaps it is just like. Um, Perhaps it's punk rearing its ugly head again. Bolt thrower, another bunch of brummies from uh, our Birmingham area. And uh, they were on another label before they actually joined Earache. They put a record out on Vinyl Solution, and that's a London based record label. That was their first album. And after that, we picked the band up. Um, they've done two albums so far Realm of Chaos and War Master. Um, they're getting really, really popular now, mainly because. The imagery they use on the record sleeves is uh, pretty over the top, you know. It's uh, like for the first album we did by them, Realm of Chaos, they used um, a company called Games Workshop. We were based here in Nottingham. They do fantasy games, you know, the, the role-playing games and stuff like that. And Bolt Thrower actually took their name from one of those games. And so, since we're based in Nottingham and the games company were, we got together to get Bolt Thrower's uh, album artwork like linked in with one of their biggest selling games. Um, so we used their artwork and that helped promote the band a lot, you know. They got, got a big big following because of that, I think. We're at the National Army Museum. That's a focus gun. And we're both up. Definitely discharged for me. Influential. Definitely. I mean, there, wasn't, there wasn't a better band yeah. in my youth for it's me. What, it's what we grew up with. I mean, like me and Baz grew up in the same kind of uh, scene. It was like punk hardcore, wasn't it? Where we, and then, and then about, was it 86, Venom and Slayer and Metallica came onto the scene and, you know, it's great. Yeah, they were you unbelievable. Know. Yeah, so, you know, it was, when I, went, I went and saw Slayer at the, um, at the marquee, it. you know. It was absolutely brilliant, like, you know, so sort of, that was a real sort of um, influence for me. That's what, you know, that's what I wanted to do, so sort I of think. War is something that is, is around us yeah, today. It's, exists. It's, it's quite interesting, especially the Gulf War. The photos from that on the news was absolutely brilliant. And I don't think it ever will finish because uh, we like it's just something that exists. Yeah. We, we're here, we don't actually put down war, we don't support is it, we don't put it down. It's just something that exists, we sing about and we find interesting. Yeah. It's gone on for centuries and it will never stop. They say there's going to be a war to end all wars at a certain time in history. But uh, as soon as that war's gone, people will be back again. Back again. There'll be yeah, little they'll tribes be. again, and then they'll just go through a whole process again. I don't think you'll ever stop it. Never ending cycle of destruction. The riffs just seem to come out. You can be playing for hours and hours without coming up with a single idea, and suddenly, right, you just get three ideas come up. 
and there's a complete song all in one go. You know, it's just it just works like that. It doesn't we don't actually say we're going to write a song like now. It'll just happen when I'm at home, humming in my head or anything. For the last two albums, we've made uh, nine songs up to go into the studio, and we when we're finished making, you know, recording everything. Baz, Baz just usually goes away because he's really in a flow of, you know, making up, playing songs. He would just make up another song. The last one on, um, what was it, on Realm of Chaos was All That Remains. Yeah. And on War Master it was um, Cenotaph, which was a single. Games Workshop, they're uh, a fantasy role-playing uh, sort of group of company. They have uh, produced artwork, magazines, and uh, role-playing games. But, you know, they got in touch with us and said, uh, you know, we want you to um, base an album around one of our games. So we used you know, Realm of Chaos, which was their the best, well, the best thing they really had, yeah. wasn't it? But our songs going to be you know, also kind of applied to a lot of the aspects within the Games Workshop fantasy world of you know, imagination. But more importantly to us, the uh, the lyrics are all about the world around us, the you know, society that we live in today, destruction, and uh, future worlds, past worlds. <laughs> Where did we record the album? Uh, Slaughterhouse in Driffield. The Slaughterhouse um, burnt down about two weeks after we used it, so, and it wasn't our fault. <laughs> Satan was not there. <laughs> we, we, we did not raise Pianzi Bob to uh, bring the downfall of civilization. <laughs> I'm not saving this country, it's not worth really saving. These are hippie kids that have like wised up a bit, got angry, got loud, they've got something to say. Uh, it's almost unintelligible, so keep coming back until you work it out or read the lyrics. A lot of people who do check out the video and, and the music and something, they say, there's no way that these dudes can be Christians, man. It just doesn't fit. And, they, and it boils back down again to their preconceptions of what Christianity is, you know, their warped and twisted versions of what they think it is, when actually the reality of what Christianity is quite different than the, the average conception of what they think it is, you know. So we get a lot of that. A lot of people say, no, these dudes can't be into that, you know. And so it's really kind of funny. But we, we dig it because it's thought-provoking. It gets them thinking about things, which is really what we want them to do. I'm not gonna 
The reason that vengeance exists is for that sake, for introducing people to knowledge that they may not have right now, that they may not have, and at least a perspective that they'll be able to take and question. And that's what we encourage them to do, to check it out and say, hey, you know, I'd like to know whether or not you're lying to me or whether or not you're telling me the truth. Because like I say, when you do that, then you come to faith on facts. You have all the different definitions, you know, you have your death, grindcore, thrash, you know, industrial grindcore, the god flesh, you know, what have you. You know, what it basically boils down to is just that which shreds, you know, so it's like, well, on if it jams, it jams, you know, whether it be, you know, anything from that, from morbid angel to deicide to vengeance to god flesh to what have you, you know, it's just, you know, really people, you, what are you going to get down to, whether or not they, you know, end up using the SPX or whether they don't, if it's, you know, the, the gnarly vocals, what have you, you know, if it's boiling down to the full on ripping, shredding drums, I mean, you got thrash grind core, just a full on ripping jams, you know, if it jams, it jams. <laughs> Most people, you know, definitely who are in the scene are very much so into the lyrics of the bands. And uh, with us, that's exactly the same case. You know, when people come down, they know what we're about. And if they don't know what we're about, we spend time before, during, and after shows with them, hanging out with them and talking to them. And that's one of the things. After a show, you know, we don't just get off the stage and then go do whatever. We hang out with the people who have come there because we really are there for that purpose, just to be able to let them know what we're about. You know, that's the whole reason that the band exists. You know, I think many people have a misconception of it of saying, well, you know, we're, am I going to get judged because I drank some beer or something? No, it's not that at all. What it boils down to is you didn't come to faith in Christ when you knew the simple facts that he was willing to forgive you because he loved you and came to the cross of Calvary to die for you. It's not a matter of fact of him slamming you because you did this or you did that, but for what you didn't do. The last line on the song is because the time is coming, that that inevitable judgment is coming. So it's just a forewarning. There's a whole like death metal grindcore scene happening in Sweden, which was, you know, it's probably one of the most exciting scenes in Europe at the moment. And there's tons of bands there who just really, you know, play this style of music really well. And then Tomb, I guess, are probably the most well known out of them, and also one of the first to get a record out.
Carcass have got some like, pretty strange lyrics, if you read them. I mean, they're really over-the-top kind of splatter lyrics and influenced by gore films and splatter films and that in general. But they take it on a more real-life level, you know, um, with songs referring to like mass murderers and stuff like that. Just two months ago now, we got a, a visit from the uh, local constabulary here, Nottingham Vice Squad it was, and uh, apparently they were just checking up on the whether some of the album sleeves might be considered obscene or not. On, um, and obviously, you know, Carcass albums are like pretty notorious for the sleeves. They've got all these um, autopsy pictures and all that kind of thing on it. And uh, I mean, their records have been out for like two years, you know, in all the shops in England and all around the world. And no one's ever uh, said that they were, you know, obscene or anything. Um, I mean, basically, we haven't heard anything yet from the police about it, and we haven't been charged or anything, so I guess things have quietened down. But um, I don't know, it's just another example of how the police or whatever, some authority can like try and clamp down on things they don't, don't agree with, really. Death has always been covered up. Um, it's a taboo subject no one really wants to talk about. Um, and that was our intention to, um, to begin with, to actually open up a lot of the, you know, what goes on, the rotting processes, you know, what happens when you're buried. Um, and unfortunately, the world is in such turmoil. Um, death it has become entertainment. front cover of Symphony of Sickness, um, in the gatefold anyway, it features you know, dead bodies. Um, it also features lumps of meat, um, because although it wasn't the prime purpose, we wanted to show really that um, animal and human meat is one and the same. So maybe that, that helps people distract away from the fact that we're not um, advocating violence or anything like that. We're totally against violence. No one really wants to talk about it because it's linked to religion, it's the afterlife. No one wants to know about the physical processes such as you know, rotting. Um, no one re really wants to know that their relatives are being cut up for an autopsy. But this is fact and that goes on, it's an everyday thing. And I don't think people should be scared of it. I mean, I think a lot of people are shocked when they see carcass live or on the street or whatever because they think they're going to be some huge monsters, uh, you know, talking about um, killing people all the time. I think there's a false impression and they're perhaps a bit disappointed when they, they actually need to find out the mild man of people. Yeah. <laughs> 
We're certainly not militant vegetarians because we couldn't care less what other people eat. It's just like, this is another thing that adds another dimension to um, the nature of the lyrics and so on. Um, but really, uh, when it comes down to it, we, we just want people to interpret it in their own way because, you know, that's what art and music and, and all kinds of entertainment are about, you know. It, you know, the listener is supposed to be a participant and, uh, you know, draw out whatever he or she wants to. The world is not a pleasant place and I think people are becoming increasingly aware of this, unfortunately, and uh, certainly Grindcore in particular has a lot to say about uh, where we can go from here, if we can go anywhere, maybe we can go the only place we can go is under, who knows? Yeah.